Coraline's parents never seemed to remember anything about their time in the snow globe. At least they never said anything about it, and Coraline never mentioned it to them. Sometimes she wondered whether they had ever noticed that they had lost two days in the real world, and came to the eventual conclusion that they had not. Then again, there are some people who keep track of every day and every hour, and there are some who don't. And Coraline's parents were solidly in the second camp. Coraline had placed the marbles beneath her pillow before she went to sleep that first night home in her own room once more. She went back to bed after she saw the other mother's hand, although there was not much time left for sleeping, and she rested her head back on the pillow. Something scrunched gently as she did so. She sat up and lifted the pillow. The fragments of the glass marbles that she saw looked like the remains of eggshells one finds beneath trees in springtime, like empty, broken robin's eggs, or even more delicate, wren's eggs, perhaps. Whatever had been inside the glass spheres had gone. Coraline thought of the three children waving goodbye to her in the moonlight, waving bef before they crossed that silver stream. She gathered up the eggshell-thin fragments with care and placed them in a small blue box which had once held a bracelet that her grandmother had given to her when she was a little girl. The bracelet was long lost, but the box remained. Miss Spink and Miss Forceball came back from visiting Miss Spink's niece, and Coraline went down to their flat for tea. It was a Monday, or on Wednesday, Coraline would go back to school. A whole new school year would begin. Miss Forceball insisted on reading Coraline's tea leaves. Well, looks like everything's mostly shipshape and Bristol fashion, lovey, said Miss Forceball. Sorry, said Coraline. Everything is coming up roses, said Miss Forcible. Well, almost everything. I'm not sure what that is. She pointed to a clump of tea leaves sticking to the side of the cup. Miss Spink tutted and reached for the cup. Honestly, Miriam, give it over here. Let me see. She blinked through her thick spectacles. Oh dear. I have no idea what that signifies. It looks almost like a hand. Coraline looked. The clump of leaves did look like a little, like a hand, reaching for something. Hamish the Scotty Dog was hiding under Miss Forcible's chair, and he wouldn't come out. I think he's he was in some sort of fight, said Miss Spink. He has a deep gash in his side, poor dear. We'll take him to the vet later this afternoon. I wish I knew what could have done it. Something, Coraline knew, would have to be done. That final week of the holidays, the weather was magnificent, as if the summer itself were trying to make up for the miserable weather they had been having by giving them some bright and glorious days before it ended. The crazy old man upstairs called down to Coraline when he saw her coming out of Miss Spinks and Miss Forcible flat. Hi, hey you, Caroline, he shouted over the railing. It's Coraline, she said. How are the mice? Something has frightened them, said the old man, scratching his moustache. I think maybe there is a weasel in the house. Something is about. I heard it in the night. In my country we would have put down a trap for it. Maybe put down a little meat or a hamburger. And when the creature comes to feast, then BAM! It would be caught and never bother us more. The mice are so scared they won't even pick up their little musical instruments. I don't think it wants meat, said Coraline. She put her hand up and touched the black key that hung about her neck. Then she went inside. She bathed herself and kept the key round her neck the whole time she was in the bath. She never took it off any more. Something scratched at her bedroom window after she went to bed. Coraline was almost asleep. But she slipped out of bed and pulled open the curtains. A white hand with crimson fingernails leapt from the window ledge onto a drain pipe and was immediately out of sight. There were deep gouges in the glass on the other side of the window. Coraline slept uneasily that night, waking from time to time to plot and plan and ponder, then falling back to sleep, never quite certain where her pondering ended and the dream began one ear always open for the sound of something scratching at her window pane or her bedroom door. In the morning, Coraline said to her mother, I'm going to have a picnic with my dolls today. Can I borrow a sheet, an old one? 
one you don't need any more, or a tablecloth. I don't think we have one of those, said her mother. She opened the kitchen drawer that held the napkins and the tablecloth. She prodded about in it. Hold on. Will this do? It was a folded up disposable paper tablecloth covered in red flowers, left over from some picnic they had been on several years before. That's perfect, said Coraline. I didn't think you played with your dolls any more, said Mrs. Jones. I don't, admitted Coraline. They're protective coloration. Well, be back in time for lunch, said her mother. Have a good time. Coraline filled a cardboard box with dolls and several plastic dolls' teacups. She filled a jug with water. Then she went outside. She walked down to the road, just as she, if she was going to the shops. Before she reached the supermarket, she cut over a fence into some wasteland, and along an old drive, then she crawled under a hedge. She had to go under the hedge in two journeys, in order not to spill the water from the jug. It was a long, roundabout, looping journey, but at the end of it, Coraline was satisfied that she had not been followed. She came out behind the dilapidated old tennis court. She crossed over to the meadow where the long grass swayed. She found the planks on the edge of the meadow. They were astonishingly heavy, almost too heavy for a girl to lift, even using all her strength, but she managed. She did not have any choice. She pulled the planks out of the way, one by one, grunting and sweating with the effort, revealing a deep, round, brick-lined hole in the ground. It smelled of damp and dark. The bricks were greenish and slippery. She spread out the tablecloth and laid it carefully over the top of the well. She put a plastic doll's cup every twenty centimetres or so at the edge of the well and weighed each cup down with water from the jug. She, took, she put a doll in the grass beside each cup, making it look as much like a doll's tea party as she could. Then she retraced her steps back under the hedge, along the dusty yellow drive, around the back of the house, back to, back to her house. She reached up and took the key from around her neck. She dangled it from the string, as if the key were just something she'd like to play with. Then she knocked on the door of Miss Spink and Miss Forcible's flat. Miss Spink opened the door. "'Hello, dear,' she said. "'I don't want to come in,' said Coraline. "'I just wanted to know how Hamish was doing.' Miss Spink sighed. "'The vet said that Hamish is a brave little soldier,' she said. "'Luckily the cut doesn't seem to be infected.' We cannot imagine what could have done it. The vet says some animal, he thinks, but has no idea what. Mr. Bobo says he thinks it might have been a weasel. Mr. Bobo? The man in the top flat. Mr. Bobo. Fine old circus family, I believe. Romanian or Slovenian or Livonian, one of those countries. Bless me, I never remember them any more. It never occurred to Coraline that the crazy old man upstairs actually had a name, she realised. If she'd known what his name was, Mr. Bobo, she would have said it every chance she got. How often do you get to say a name like Mr. Bobo out loud? Oh, said Coraline to Miss Spink. Mr. Bobo, right. Well, she said a little louder, I'm going to go play with my dolls now, over by the old tennis court, round the back. That's nice, dear, said Miss Spink. Then she added confidentially, "'Make sure you keep an eye out for the old well. Mr. Lovat, who was here before your time, said he thought he, it might go down for half a mile or more.' Coraline hoped that the hand had not heard this last remark. Then she changed the subject. "'The key?' said Coraline loudly. "'Oh, it's just some old key from my house. It's part of my game. That's why I'm carrying it around with me on this piece of string. Well, good-bye now.' "'What an extraordinary child!' said Miss Spink to herself as she closed the door. Coraline ambled across the meadow towards the old tennis court, dangling and swinging the black key on its piece of string as, it walk as she walked. Several times she thought she saw something, the colour of bone in the undergrowth. It was keeping pace with her about ten metres away. She tried to whistle, but, so, but nothing happened. So she sang out loud instead. A song her father had made up for her when she was a little baby, which had always made her laugh. It went, 
My twitchy witchy girl, I think you are so nice. I give you balls of porridge and I give you balls of ice cream. I give you lots of kisses and I give you lots of hugs. But I never give you sandwiches with bugs in. That was what she sang and she sauntered through the woods and her voice hardly trembled at all. The doll's tea party was where she had left it. She was relieved that it was not a windy day, for everything was still in place. Every water-filled plastic cup weighed down the paper tablecloth as if it was meant to. She breathed a sigh of relief. Now was the hardest part. Hello, dolls, she said brightly. It's tea time. She walked close to the paper tablecloth. I brought the lucky key, she told the dolls, to make sure we have a good picnic. And then, as carefully as she could, she leaned over and gently placed the key on the tablecloth. She was still holding to the string. She held her breath, hoping that the cups of water at the edges of the well well, would weigh the key down, letting it take the weight of the key without collapsing into the well. The key sat in the middle of the the paper picnic cloth. Coraline let go of the string and took a step back. Now it was all up to the hand. She turned to her dolls. Who would like a piece of cherry cake? she asked. Jemima? Pinky? Primrose? She served each doll a slice of invisible cake on an invisible plate, chattering happily as she did so. From the corner of her eye she saw something, bone white scamper from one tree trunk to the other, closer and closer. She forced herself not to look at it. Jemima, said Coraline, what a bad girl you are, you've dropped your cake. Now I'll have to go over and get you a whole new slice. And she walked round the tea party until she was on the other side of it, on the hand. She pretended to clean up spilled white, spilled cake, and then to get Jemima another piece. And then, in a skittering, chittering rush it came, the hand running high on its fingertips scrabbled through the tall grass and up onto a tree stump. It stood there for a moment, like a crab tasting the air, and then it made one triumphant nail-clacking leap onto the centre of the papal tablecloth. Time slowed for Coraline. The white fingers closed round the black key and then the weight and the momentum of the hand sent the plastic doll's cups flying and the paper, paper tablecloth and the key and the other mother's right hand went tumbling down into the darkness of the well. Coraline counted slowly under her breath. She counted up to forty before she heard a muffled splash coming from a long way below. Someone had told her that if you look up at the sky from the bottom of a mine shaft. Even in the brightest daylight, you'll see a night sky and stars. Coraline wondered if the hand could see stars from where it was. She hauled the heavy blanks, planks back onto the well, covering it as carefully as she could. She didn't want anything to fall in. She didn't want anything ever to get out. Then she put her dolls and the cups back in the cardboard box where she had carried them out in. Something caught her eye while she was doing this. She straightened up in time to see the black cat stalking towards her, its tail held high and curling at the tip like the question mark. It was the first time she had seen the cat in several days, since they had returned together from the other mother's place. The cat walked over to her and jumped up onto the planks that covered the well. Then, slowly, it winked one eye at her. It sprang down into the long grass in front of her and rolled over onto its back, wiggling about ecstatically. Coraline scratched and tickled the soft fur on its belly, and the pat purred contentedly. When it had had enough, it had rolled over onto its front once more, and walked back towards the tennis court, like a tiny patch of midnight in the midday sun. Coraline went back to the house. Mr Bobo was waiting for her in the driveway. He clapped her on the shoulder. "'The mice tell me all is good.' he said. They say you are our saviour, Caroline. It's Coraline, Mr. Bobo, said Coraline. Not Caroline. Coraline. Coraline, said Mr. Bobo, repeating her name to himself with wonderment and respect. Very good, Coraline. The mice say I must tell you that as soon as they are ready to perform in public, you will come up and watch them as the first audience of all. They will play Tumpity Umpity and Toodle-Oodle, and they will dance and do a thousand tricks. That is what they say. 
"'Oh, I'd like that very much,' said Coraline, when they're ready. She knocked at Miss Spink's and Miss Forcible's door. Miss Spink let her in, and Coraline went into their parlour. She put her box of dolls down on the floor. Then she put her hand into a pocket and pulled out the stone with the hole in it. "'Here you go,' she said. "'I don't need it any more. I'm very grateful. I think it may have saved my life, and saved some other people's deaths.' She gave them both tight hugs, although her arms barely stretched around Miss Spink and Miss Forcible. Smelled like raw garlic she had been cutting. Then Coraline picked up the box of dolls and went out. "'What an extraordinary child!' said Miss Spink. No one had hugged her like that since she had retired from the theatre. That night Coraline lay in bed, all bathed, teeth cleaned with her eye open, staring up at the ceiling. It was warm enough that, now that the hand was gone, she had opened her bedroom window wide. She had insisted to her father that the curtains not be entirely closed. Her new school clothes were laid out carefully on her chair for her to put them on when she woke. Normally, on the night before the first day of term, Coraline was apprehensive and nerveless. But, she realised, there was nothing left about school that could scare her any more. She fancied she could hear sweet music on the night air, the kind of music that can only be played on the tiniest silver trombones and trumpets and bassoons, on piccolos and tubas so delicate and small that their keys could only be pressed by the tiny pink fingers of white mice. Coraline imagined that she was back again in her dream, with the two girls and the boy under the oak tree in the meadow, and she smiled. As the first stars came out, Coraline finally allowed herself to drift off into sleep, while the gentle upstairs music of the mouse circus spilled out onto the warm evening air, telling the world that the summer was almost over. <laughs>